Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's had their coffee already because we're going to be having a really, I guess, exciting discussion about artificial intelligence because ready or not, AI is coming for you and your company. It's a simple fact, disrupt or be disrupted. And to delve deeper into the new age of AI, please welcome to the stage Quinn Hardy, head of editorial for Google Cloud, in conversation with Macario Naimi, CMO of ASAP, a company that designs machine learning capabilities to enable automation and work simplification, Amir Hussein, the founder and CEO of global AI leader, Spark Cognition, and General Raymond Anthony Thomas III, but he goes by Tony. Uh, retired general of the U.S. Army and former commander of the U.S. Special Forces, Special Operations Command. As you know, this conference, more than any other I go to, is about the profitable impact of technology in business, trying to figure out how this takes place. And that's about upending incumbents sometimes, about gaining margin, about otherwise remaking the operations of institutions, and seeing the markets in new ways for greater efficiency and benefit. Uh, the curve of how this happens is pretty familiar to people at this point. That doesn't mean it's any easier than it ever was. But a new technology comes into place, it finds some value, but then it really blossoms, it really takes hold, it really makes dramatic impacts as people figure out the most important dimensions and how they upend the behavior in the marketplace in one form or other. That might be workflows, that might be supply chains. Um, a good example would be electric power. When people realized it wasn't about having a big electric motor in the center driving belts like steam had, it was about how you could put small electric motors all over the place and reform the factory. Or the way FedEx looked at planes and computing and thought, logistics has completely changed, we can exploit this. Or the way Google looked at web pages and thought, it's not just about the content, it's about the links and that re-up that market. In every case, there's an aspect of the technology that really transforms things. It builds off the old, but takes it in a whole new direction. And I think we're at that stage with AI now. It's pretty well proven. She said AI is coming. If you did a Google search today, you touched AI. You probably touched AI in many other ways. If you went to Facebook, you touched AI. AI is baked into lots of business processes but that doesn't mean it's over. It means it's found its place and it's about to hit that point where it's going to find lots of new places based on its genius. And that's what I think we can talk about profitably today, how this is going to remake work and institutional behavior and how much of a change that's going to be and the benefits that will throw off. So that's probably enough out of me. We have three really smart guys who can take this apart a little bit and I'll try and help them along. Uh, to my right is Amir Hussain, founder and CEO of Spark, Spark Cognition, Makario Naimi, CMO of ASAP, and General Thomas, you've heard before about. Um, let me start with a question for Amir and Makario, and then I'll tweak it for you, General. Uh, talk a little bit about your company. We know about your company, General. <laughs> and uh, then your biggest successes these days, how you got there and how that encounter with the market and its previous practices uh, educates you about where AI is going next. I'll start with you, Amir. Sure, thank you. So Spark Cognition, we started about five and a half years ago, and the mission was to really apply artificial intelligence to physical industrial systems. We thought that much of that technology came from decades hence, and, and in some cases, century-old technology that could really benefit from the smarts that artificial intelligence could imbue in these systems, whether for uh, predictive maintenance, whether for operational efficiency, whether to uh, improve um, uh, the environmental performance of these assets, safety. There were a large number of reasons. So the first thing was, of course, for us to build the company and prove this thesis out. And we had to apply very advanced technology, automated model building technology, natural language processing technology, and a variety of other things that I can talk about later, to reduce the cost of building predictive models. Because in a large company, when you want to apply this technology at scale to really move the needle, one or two experimental projects are not enough. They don't move the needle. 
So not only do you have to make a difference with AI and come up with predictions that are meaningful for the business with AI, but you have to do that with an enabling technology that can reduce the cost of the models that you deploy, so you can deploy more of them. In pioneering this technology and then taking it out to market, we saw tremendous success in a number of verticals, which include energy, in uh, particular oil and gas. Uh, some of the largest super majors now are Spark Cognition customers. Some public customers include Acker BP. Uh, we've deployed our systems now on offshore platforms where they are constantly monitoring and modeling dozens and dozens of key subsystems and delivering amazing results, finding production impact events and preventing them from happening, and saving tons of money. In the automotive space, just yesterday we announced a partnership with uh, the world's number one hypercar company, Koenigsegg. Uh, they produce uh, the highest performance cars in the world, and we are now going to partner with them to imbue our AI technology in their combustion engine design to really create a new breed of combustion engine. So in automotive, you see successes like that, and very large automotive companies that we have not yet announced are also working with us. And then finally, of course, in the defense space, um, General Thomas has been a tremendous leader at SOCOM, and his vision is what has allowed that organization to understand the imperative that is AI within defense. Um, and while he was in service, I had the honor of working with him and many of his colleagues and many of his peers. Uh, clearly, we need to take DOD forward in these areas, and Spark Cognition has done its small bit. There's a lot more to do, but the message is AI is here. It's making a difference. It is productized. It's ready to deploy at scale, and its wins are now countable, and they are significant. Okay, so... Essentially, you have built this out as a replicable model yeah. that is particular to each industry, each company even, mm -hmm. that's trying to expose its comparative advantage to the greatest degree possible. Take all the friction out of the way and just focus on the thing you do best. What happens when most of the friction's out of the way? Does the model turn on itself and improve itself? Does the company kind of virtualize? Well, how do you see yeah. this changing the way a company looks? Well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about this. This is one <laughs> of the uh, topics that's... Briefly, I need to move down the line. Yeah, absolutely. Here. But it's nearest and dearest to my heart, and hopefully we'll revisit this. But this is really the doorway to the model-driven enterprise. <laughs> the new reinvention of companies will be around uh, identifying key workflows that are profitable workflows that run through your companies and deconstructing and recombining them into model-driven processes. You perceive something, you decide on something, you act on something. That is the rough template for a model-driven process. And if you can control the economics and reduce the cost of building and maintaining that model, you have a revolution at your hands, both in terms of scale and speed. So I'll pause here and hopefully we'll get we'll an opportunity to revisit this. We'll pick that up in a minute because yes. I'm, I'm establishing the ground up. Yeah. Please. Sure. My name is Macario Davy with ASAP. ASAP was founded five years ago on the principle that AI and machine learning can be used to augment knowledge workers in such a way as to make them radically more productive. <clears throat> Uh, really on a magnitude of scale not seen since the advent of business process automation software 40 years ago. Uh, if you think about how people work, why they do what they do, why they make the decisions they make, how they get information, it's actually an extraordinarily difficult problem to deconstruct. And in fact, the state of the arts is still very much forming. We have a very large research team in, uh, in disciplines like natural language processing, um, uh, speech recognition and others that help us sort of continue to advance the field so that we can do uh, the work that we do. Uh, we actually started uh, as our first application in the customer experience teams. Customer care, uh, inbound sales. Um, one, it's uh, a massive, massive problem. I would even argue it's a broken problem. It's a broken process. Uh, nobody loves calling customer care. Um, we all have had the experience of getting on the phone and hitting zero, 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 or saying representative, 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 just trying to get past all of the automation and deflection technologies that these companies present in front of us. Um, and we reach an agent, and the likelihood of you being satisfied or dissatisfied is really the luck of the draw. Did you get an agent who knows what to do or not? 
um, and we believe that's a problem that can be addressed. Secondly, it matters. Customer experience matters. Uh, and, um, and third, it costs companies a lot of money today. Comcast, as an example, has 40,000 agents. Marriott, 10,000. Charter Communications, 25,000. They're spending well over uh, $1.5 billion a year just on labor costs alone. So any incremental improvement in that domain um, has a material impact. And, uh, and that's really what we do, is we, we help companies get that material impact from the workers that they have today, uh, and not only making them more productive, but also delivering a better customer experience. And looking at your website, one of the astonishing things is uh, something like 75% of the company is involved in R&D, mm -hmm. uh, which means you must be really good at talking to your investors <laughs> because it doesn't usually work like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and looking at the jobs, it's just NLP, natural language processing, understanding speech. Yeah. And clearly, the it seemed to me that the insight here was conversation and speech are exceptionally rich, and we're leaving something on the table if we're not yeah. capturing that and analyzing that in some detail. There is efficiency, and we talk about this initially as an efficiency stage, yeah. but there seems to be something else going on, as well as just gaining efficiency that can be mined from conversation. It, it, absolutely, and I, I, would go even, I would go even further. I mean, if you think about just the customer care organization, we all imagine these call centers filled with, uh, filled with people. Um, they're talking all day long. Um, and they're talking to the company's most precious resource, which is their customers. Uh, and understanding that conversation and what's transpiring and what the customer is saying, what they're really meaning, um, is vitally important if we want to make that agent better at their job. But frankly, conversation is not enough. We do invest quite a bit in natural language processing, as well as other elements of machine learning and data science, even sort of a next generation robotic process automation type technologies, because what did the agent do to solve the customer issue takes more than just what did they say. And uh, understanding just simple things, what did they click on, what application did they go to, what data did they input, what data did they receive back and say back to the customer. All of those are signals and important data points to be able to replicate your best agent and tell your lesser agents, here's, here's what you do. That's, uh, it, it points to a really interesting seeming paradox about AI. Because what you're talking about is automation at enormous scale in the service of personalization. That's right. You know, the very large helping out the particular. That's right. That's and exactly that's right. a real big change in the way people organize. Yeah. Now, General, I'm going to turn to you and I'll tweak the question a little bit because um, your previous business is the spear point of national order and um, competition among states and now with non state actors as well, increasingly over your career. I wanted to talk about, um, have you talk about your experience with technology over time, how the military and maybe other large government institutions engage with technology because they are very, very driven by history typically. And how do they take on something like AI? How is it changing the military and how do you see it changing the military? I, I guess one of the advantages that we have in special operations is that, uh, and it certainly wasn't a requirement for me to spur innovation, uh, initiative, uh, and, and embracing new technology. Our, our warriors, men and women, do it all the time. In fact, the, the, the biggest challenge is to, uh, uh, to identify you know, applicable technology that we can scale to the whole force, be interoperable, and then be agile enough to leap ahead to the next, the next thing that's available. Um, I, I'd like to think we're that agile. We, we can do better, but uh, certainly we were a pathfinder for the Department of Defense mm. in, in our, ability, our ability to adapt. Certainly the last 19 years of, of continuous combat has been a living laboratory of experimentation and, and adaptation. Um, good in a lot of ways in terms of what we've been able to integrate. Uh, not so good in that it's not a peer competitor. Um, so when we think of China and Russia now as identified peer competitors, you can clearly see there's a gap. that They are getting rep repetitions right now uh, in the AI uh, spectrum that, that we aren't, that, that we're, we're mulling the righteousness or the, or the, uh, or the policy. The ethical dimension. The ethical the dimension. Violence, typical, yeah. typical American approach, which is not bad, but our adversaries don't have that self-righteous indignation. They're, they are moving out. They, they, and I mean, if you need anything more compelling than Putin saying, whoever gets it, you know, it's almost Nathan Bedford Forrest for the 2020 time frame. Who gets it first is most is, you know, wins. Um, they, they are, they are uh, keen on getting this advantage in, in, in the artificial intelligence well, space. Well, you know far more than I do, but I would push back a little bit. In some ways, the U.S. 
has become very good at kind of doing a reverse Facebook and finding people who don't want to be found. You know, and, ma and mapping organizations that don't want to be mapped. It's well, that's sort of the like, nature of our business. I mean, right. Specifically, our, my business, but... Uh, since 9-11 in particular. Since 9-11. Manhunting, you know, network dismantling has been our calling card. Uh, and we and with, uh, to your point, with a lot of the same approaches and applications that uh, the major, you know, uh, uh, social media organizations or data organizations uh, are, are uh, driven, we've, we've tried to, you know, call that, you know... Right. And the Russians have been exceptional at being grievers, in a sense. They, mm -hmm. uh, it's a, in a gaming term, some, a griever is somebody who comes on and just wrecks the fun for everybody else. You know, and they, right. they pollute, they, they misinform, they, they create fog. And I think you said last night, um, it's a war on information. Right. It's not an information war. They're, they're, they're thriving in a disrupted environment. They, they don't necessarily care that it's you know, uh, anarchic in a, in a way. They, they are intent on disrupting information and then, uh, you know, taking advantage of that. Right. It, it helps the cause of authoritarianism generally. Especially with a specific goal that Russia has of dismantling NATO. Um, they get involved in local elections. They, they, their intent is just to disrupt the solidarity of, of, a, of the, the yeah. adversary organization in the form of they've, NATO. They've, they're still in the violence business, but they're also in the cynicism business right. in a way. And uh, with China, it is, it seems a little bit more um, linear in a sense. They're doing the kind of state management they always did with computers and putting it also into their aircraft carriers and large military. Is that accurate? Um, some have disparaged it as kind of knuckle dragging, uh, clumsy. I, I have to admire the coherency across all their elements of power that, and again, the fact that they are getting continuous reps have enormous amounts of data. I mean, just that, that you know, have already eclipsed us in almost every regard. So um, yes, in terms of integration and, and whether or not it's as good or as refined as, as some of our AI approaches, it will get there uh, over time. They, they're, they're, they're feeding the beast. So all three institutions are changing because of this in different ways, aren't they? Three institutions of? The three military of these, these three competing powers. It, it's a race. Yeah, what do we need to do? Um, I would mentioned yesterday, um, and, and I, I think we've had our collective epiphany in the Department of Defense that we need to embrace the technology, that we need to integrate it sooner, uh, as soon as possible. Um, the dilemma has been, how, to, how do we change the workforce, how do we educate ourselves, how do we change the workforce? Cannot do it organically. Uh, I, you know, I don't think we can get there from here. We, we should amass uh, you know, the, the, the critical mass of data scientists and, and whatnot. Uh, but the private-public partnership, uh, never more important. Uh, we, we are dependent on, on uh, mating and, and, and uh, matching with, with private partners to, to help us you know, to, to gain this advantage. Mm -hmm. you okay. know, and you know there have been some, some notorious efforts and, and some, some others that have actually gone very well. I wish you well. And that business of changing work and changing institutional structure is a complicated thing. I wanted to turn back to you, Amir, in this sense. And AI gets a certain mystique in the world. But at another level, AI is really the leveraging of the most basic stuff humans do. The thing humans do that we're really good at is sorting out and finding patterns and then leveraging them. And AI is pattern finding and pattern leveraging at an enormous scale that we've never seen before. What is it that's really special about AI that differentiates it from previous technologies? Because in saying that, I think we're going to be saying how it will change work and markets in the future. Yeah, and you know, um, the, the easy answer to this question is to imagine a future state within which we have artificial general intelligence. And the very definition of that is that it's intelligence that's superior to uh, human intelligence, and then I can give you all sorts of science fiction stories as to what happens after that. But the more practical way of taking this question is to say the artificial intelligence that exists today, that we're selling, building, refining, deploying today, how does that represent improvement over, say, equivalent human processes? So uh, in order to look at this, you really have to get very detailed. Uh, we worked with one of the largest aviation companies in the world to show that one of the problems that pilots have, which is that 
um, if there's a malfunction while they're on the runway and the aircraft is picking up speed, uh, speed, it's getting to 100, 120 knots, they have to decide if there's a malfunction, whether to abort the takeoff or whether to continue and try and take flight and then come back and land. And that's a life and death decision. So we built an AI system that in extensive simulations showed that not only does the AI actually make that decision with higher precision and accuracy, in the sense that whenever it decided that the uh, takeoff should be aborted, it was right more often than the human expert. But on average, it was making those decisions two seconds prior to the best human experts, mm -hmm. which means a lot of lives saved. Now, that's not a system that'll start reciting poetry from Rumi or Hafiz to you, but at the same time... That's okay. That's okay, because it does its job. Yeah. It does its job. And it does its job in a way that is uh, absolutely uh, fit for task. Now, uh, you start looking at a lot of these instances. We found when we were working with offshore oil rigs, we found that you know the, the holy grail there was, was to detect and avoid what's called a production impact event. Now, you've got 70 subsystems all working together in this big, giant offshore rig. And with a rule-based mechanism, which is what you know, traditionally people have used for some of this equipment, you can say, you know, if this gets hotter than X, then that's a problem. If this runs faster than Y, then that's a problem. All these rules across all this equipment. But turns out that the interaction, the interplay of all of those subsystems, even when individually, each asset is doing totally fine. It's within its uh, safety margins. The interplay of these assets can create catastrophes. So with AI, we found a lens to identify such complex phenomena that human beings weren't being able to identify and put their finger on. So with AI, in some sense, we've developed another kind of a microscope, another kind of a telescope. Mm. It's sort of what is AI today? In the perception area, AI is what the telescope was some number of hundreds of years ago, where we kind of had a clue that there was something out there, but this tool allowed us to really build a science around that observation. That's and a very tantalizing point, because once they had the microscope and they turned the tube around and had the telescope, they also began to analyze the world in a much more hierarchical way large to small exactly. in a more disciplined way, which really spurred the scientific revolution. These tools are very important for how you see the world as well. Yeah, and look, the evolution of man is basically finding the higher cognitive plane every few years, decades, millennia. And I feel that artificial intelligence, in the sense that it, it is a tool, it is a cognitive telescope or a cognitive microscope, whatever science you prefer, astronomy or biology, the reality is that it is a doorway to that higher cognitive plane. So it's not about what artificial intelligence will do, it's what we will do with artificial intelligence. I do think that there will come a time when artificial intelligence systems will synthesize a lot of their capabilities and AGI-like systems will be possible. But those days are far away. What I'm more enamored with and I'm what, what I'm driven by every day is to take the technology we've already built and apply it to almost every nook and cranny of this world and reinvent this into a better, friendlier, more eco-friendly, more efficient, uh, safer world. Well, that layers on top of what we were saying before because the friction gets out of the way and people are good at doing their highest value activities, but they also begin to perceive themselves in much more complex ecosystems exactly. that they can engage with. Exactly. So that'll be a new hunt for value. Um, Macario, let me take that into your business because there's a new kind of learning you're exploiting, almost a swarm learning, by analyzing the capabilities of the best salesmen and analyzing the most successful customer interactions and then using that to train other people inside the system. Yeah. How does that work? Yeah, I mean, so if, uh, if you think about kind of large contact centers um, and you ask them the questions like, well, what do you do when you just don't know what to do? Um, 
there was actually a, real, a survey one of the research analysts did. 50% said, well, I just put the customer on hold and I tap the person next to me and be like, hey, what should I do here? Now, we're hoping that the person next to them is actually any good. Ultimately, you're trying to replicate that. You're trying to replicate somebody whispering in their ear, do this, do that, say this, say that. Um, and the only way you can learn what to say, what to do, is by taking ideally your best people and understanding how they handled themselves in certain situations. What did they say? What did they do? Um, now, the good news in the domain that we've chosen to, to play in and around customer experience seems there's a lot of data. There's just a ton of data and there's a ton of people. So you, can, so you have the, enough data to be able to build those kinds of models. Um, today, our real, uh, our real competition are, are rules-based systems. These architectures that were designed in the 80s and they really still exist today. If you look at who, who are the stalwarts of enterprise software, it's the Oracles and the SAPs and most recently the Salesforces. And um, obviously excellent technologies, but the architecture fundamentally, despite how they're delivered uh, or hosted, the architecture is roughly the same. It's, a, it's a, a, a very structured database and a series of rules that you hope some system administrator can, can come in and replicate what they think should happen. Um, and so what happens when you sort of maxed out what that system administrator right. can do. It's like there's only so much that the human brain can, pro can process. Uh, and, uh, and that's where I think the, the productivity benefits of these, of these old architectures just kind of plateaued. Uh, and that's, that's really where we think the transformative impact of AI can really... Can, and that's, really that's an interesting dimension of this because in this, you know, carrying forward this model of AI imposed on the past and then AI generating its own future, um, in both the businesses you're describing, in general, and to some extent, what you described, um, AI is eliminating friction, AI is co creating efficiency, AI is getting you further problem solving, which sounds sort of like the world's gonna get kind of boring or leveled out. You know, we're all as good as the best salesmen. But then there's this other level where the best salesman also needs assistance from some new actor, mm -hmm. or the business exists in a greater complexity that it hadn't seen before. And as you've seen the research, a group of five experts in the same area are not as effective as five people from more diverse backgrounds mm -hmm. when it comes to problem solving. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of, um, this implies organizing teams and spotting different kinds of input to define the ecosystem in better ways and interact with it as it changes, creates new work for humans, because the machines are unlikely to be able to do that very well at first. Yeah. So with that in mind, General, I'd ask you, what do you think the work of special forces will look like? How will the teams change as AI comes into it? Um, I'd, I'd like to pick up on a thread that Amir laid down. That By all means. That um, the application of this Technology or this, uh, you know, and, and which I think is transformational. I'd, I'd go to f as far to say I think it's going to be revolutionary, and I don't. I, I'm very hesitant to say you know, revolutionary in military affairs, but I, it'll enhance everything we're doing. Give me um, a, give I, me an example. How do you think it'll change? When you well, hear about this stuff, what do you yeah, envision? Interestingly, I, I thought early on, and, and it was based on what we were doing uh, in the Maven project. I thought uh, the immediate impact would be tor towards targeting, what we call targeting, in terms of discerning adversaries, ensuring no collateral damage, and then taking the shot. I, I thought it would be, you know, have an immediate uh, enhancement there, and it has to a degree. Um, but as I was fixated on that, and, and based on how I was brought, you know, brought up and, and my experience, I didn't expect that the, the immediate, you know, quick win for our formation was in predictive maintenance. Less sexy, not, not, not something that we thought was going to, you know, going to be the, the first thing that we uh, you know, touted as you know, instant you know, return on investment. But we, interestingly, we own the data for our helicopters. Big point. Wasn't in some prime somewhere, wasn't something we had to ask for and beg for. We owned our own, our own data for our Special Operations Aviation Regiment, uh, the 160th. And we're, we're already churning on it. And then as we brought in, you know, private sector, you know, experts, uh, we were act actually the, the exemplar for the department in terms of predictive maintenance. And you think both operationally very important, but the cost savings uh, are extraordinary. Um, as I've gotten in the private sector and been associated with a, with a particular aviation company, 
I've been amazed at the number of companies that are still working on manually manipulated Excel spreadsheets to do maintenance, you know, and what, what they think is predictive maintenance instead of give it to the machine. The machine will absolutely, you know, provide you a better product, you know, but you have to start. And, and of course, everybody, well, my data's not ready. Get it ready. Start now. Time now. You know, get to it. Right. Right. And that gets you to the highest value work for the team. They want to be in the chopper. If the chopper is undergoing some emergency maintenance, that's a lot of downtime and a lost opportunity. Yeah. The, the, the debate, again, I, what I challenged our workforce was tell me what it doesn't apply to. I was, I was somewhat motivated by uh, McAfee and Brinjolfson of not being the hippo. If you've ever read Machine Platform Crowd, they talk about the hippo phenomenon, and that's the highest paid person's opinion, uh, that male or female in the, in the corner office who sits back and makes big arm waves and says, give me some of that AI stuff, has no <laughs> idea what it's all about. Um, but I, I challenged our workforce and I said, please tell me, I'm, 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 I'm the oldest and potentially most stunted about this, you know, this, this new technology. Where doesn't it apply to our workforce? You know how many people came back into the office to say, I don't think it applies to, to this aspect of what we're doing? Zero. Um, but the harder part then was, okay, how, how do you integrate it across a broad attack surface? You know, we, and we start binning things, the predictive maintenance for, for aircraft, hiring, critically important for hiring um, as you go forward. You, you, mm. you can get a better predictive model, even as, as, uh, as uh, extraordinary as, as our selection process is to get the best and brightest into special operations, we can and are, are starting to do better in terms of you know, uh, uh, you know, integrating and, and uh, enabling our decision making with AI. Okay, so that's an example of how the force has changed. Let me ask you two. Um, how, how do your customers change as they start to work with your products? What do they report back to you about what they're doing differently? Um, so in, 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 in our world, uh, in the customer experience domain, uh, for frontline agents, there's an employee turnover industry average about 45%. Um, and it typically takes somewhere between three to four months to ramp somebody. And then they're gone in, within a couple of years. Um, having an impact on employee satisfaction actually matters a lot. It, there's a very direct line to, to cost and economic impact of that. Um, most of what the, creates employee dissatisfaction is just the mundane and the routine. It's just the mundane and the routine and the fact that you have angry customers on the other end, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, if you're able to uh, eliminate at least some of that, and provide a higher quality answer, the right answer, and sort of delight your customers in that way, it actually has a very uh, direct impact on employee satisfaction. In addition to the, the kind of obvious, which is you're asking people to, to work on their brains and not just sort of do routine tasks that can be easily automated. Um, and so, uh, you know, they just, they're actually, they're high, the high pro profile of hiring has to change because you're asking people to work on the most complex stuff. Mm. Automation and even things like chatbots have sort of eliminated a lot of the transactional side of the world. Now what do you do when you have nothing but really complex, complicated questions that you have to answer? It's just a different type of person that, uh, that is capable of doing that. One thing you're pointing to in both cases, all three, is we're going to have to start educating people to dealing with complexity in a whole different way. Mm -hmm. That's going to have to be baked into the educational system early on. Yeah because we're seeing the world differently. How do your customers say they behave differently? Uh, I would say there's, uh, there's two uh, classes of customers for us uh, that have seen real value out of AI and that's kind of changed their behaviors and their approach. First of all, there's obviously there's cynicism around when you bring in a technology like predictive maintenance that's driven by data. And for decades, this work has been done with physics-based models with their own limitations. There's a large number of people that are huge believers in that existing uh, technology. But once we're able to show that, look, this is better, faster, less expensive, and you can build the models quicker, their eyes open and they realize that this is about scale. AI right now in industry is about scale. The human expertise that you could apply in one or two or three places that you deemed to be very important well, you did apply that human expertise there, but you didn't have enough human expertise to go around and sprinkle it in all of the important places in your company. But with artificial intelligence, now you can do that. With these data-based models, you can do that. So that's been one type of customer where they've seen uh, the capabilities of uh, artificial intelligence and they look at it as a means to scale. 
The other one is potentially even more exciting and more important. And the example here is our partnership and our joint venture with the Boeing company. Uh, just about a year ago, we launched a 50-50 joint venture with Boeing uh, to apply our artificial intelligence technology to track uh, aerial vehicles, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, and to create this uh, aerial operating system for the future, which would um, bring predictive maintenance, uh, or autonomous cybersecurity, uh, vehicle tracking, all of these things that in the current way in which aircraft are maintained, flown, piloted, routed, those techniques simply don't scale to a world where you have millions of unmanned aircraft. And that's a world to which we are now going. So there is a need to build a new infrastructure. And what Boeing realized and what we realized was that the only way to do this was to do it with artificial intelligence. There aren't enough human maintenance experts, there aren't enough human pilots, there aren't enough human ATC controllers to actually go through every route. So this second category is the enablement of an entirely new model and the unlock of an entirely new market. And we see our customers use AI in both these ways, solving tactical problems better and achieving scale, and secondly, unlocking massive new markets that with the current models without AI simply wouldn't have been possible to unlock. A million flying vehicles in the air around the world, manned and unmanned at any given time. That's life in three dimensions in a way we've just never exactly. experienced. Airspace becomes uh, what... Uh, becomes you know, workspace uh, and not workspace. just a transport area. And, and network space. You know, think about what you know, high-performance high routers and what Cisco did for the internet, that technology for three-dimensional space does not exist. SkyGrid is a first foray into developing that. Are these conversations you have with your friends in the military, <laughs> are they aware this is going on? And how do they view all this? We have that, that conversation with Amir and others. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then you go talk to your buddies back at the Pentagon. How, how are they viewing all this? Uh, hesitantly, hesitantly in, in some cases, um, but I... I actually have found a kind of a disturbing phenomenon there as well as in the private sector and in and, uh, and, and, and some major companies. And it's the three, it's a triple-headed mantra. Uh, there are a lot of snake oil salesmen out there in the AI, AI business. It's not ready for prime time and it'll disrupt your workforce. I might pull this thread on, on those individually. There are snake oil salesmen out there that can describe AI up and down, left and right, and can't deliver product, but there are a lot of companies that are delivering extraordinary product right now. You, you just need to do your homework. Secondly, um, not ready for prime time, I usually push back and, and, and challenge, what alternative universe are you living in right now? Uh, because you, know, you pick the company knows more about you than you know about yourself. Uh, you, you mentioned AI is coming at you every day, whether or not you see it as AI. You use it, yeah. It's thinking for you, it's trying to sell you stuff, it's trying to, it, in some cases, trying to make your life better, and some type, in some cases, making it worse. The third point, though, I think is the one that should grab every company that's out there, the disruptive nature to your workforce. The longer you wait, the more irrelevant uh, and the more vulnerable your workforce is going to be. Um, uh, too many companies that I interact with are, are still caught up in this, this is the five-year-out phenomenon, not coming, you know, it's, it's not here yet, uh, give it time. Uh, those companies are almost walking dodos. They will, they will be extinct, you know, in, in, in short order if, if, if they don't you know, um, embrace this phenomenon and, and go with it. I'm, I, I, it's not, it's more a challenge. In, in fact, we said the same thing internally to our workforce. Uh, first point of order, get smart. Educate yourself now. Uh, we're not gonna furlough anybody, but you, you gotta pick up the pace in terms of understanding, you know, what, what, what the opportunity is here and then bringing it into the, into the program. In a couple of minutes, I'll open up to questions from the floor, but I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that I work for Google and- um, Who? Uh, <laughs> You'll hear it. They're, they're going to be the Bing of search. Um, the, um, we, we compete with your company for sure, Macario, yeah. and to some extent we may compete with yours, Amira. What's it like competing with big companies and what are our strengths and where are we weak and how can you succeed? I'm not going to give you the blueprint, uh, if you, but uh, trust me. So th there, there's <laughs> there's some obvious ones of how any startup competes with a large company, right? Um, dedicated focus, um, the ability to more deeply understand uh, the, the the customers, their buyers, what their what their environment is. Um, our motivations are very very different. 
we are an That's applications company with uh, with you know a lot of technology under the hood, but we consider ourselves an applications company, and we want to sell uh, the ability to transform some, somebody's business process and how mm -hmm. they operate. Um, and a lot of times when we come up with folks such as Google Cloud, uh, there's a lot of hey, we'll just throw this stuff in, just give us your cloud business, right? And um, and so we, we've seen that a lot. Um, and so there's just not. Um, I'm not talking specifically about Google, but others like it. I was taking uh, that personally. And, uh, and so as a result, um, they, there's a level of focus that typically does, doesn't exist, um, a level of depth that typically doesn't exist in some of these larger organizations. Uh, and uh, that's, a, that's a key way. We, we tend to win against larger companies. Fair. Oh, my How are you going to bury us? <clears throat> oh, we'd, we'd partner with you before we think about anything Elbow else. bump. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And, and we are partnered with Google, but the way I look at it is, look, uh, industrial companies um, and many other companies have seen the rise of four or five very large tech companies that used to be called tech companies, now they're called everything companies. So it's data. It's data, and so data powers all these different industries, and now these are everything companies. So you've got Google with two aviation companies, and you've got Amazon with an aviation as well as logistics business and self-driving vehicle investments, and everyone's doing everything. So if you go to an industrial giant and you say, uh, you have the option of working with the best team in industrial AI in the world because we're focused on that, and this is what we've been doing for years, we don't do all the other stuff that one of these other companies, we don't do retail, we don't do all the other, uh, these other things. And by the way, uh, all of this information is yours. We're not looking to learn from it and resell it and do any of that. Um, and by the way, the alternative is an everything company. You can take all your stuff, you can put it there, and then, um, you know, whatever business you're in, if a product like that emerges a year or two years down the road from this everything company, it shouldn't surprise you. Because I don't know that many people would have predicted that five, six, seven, eight years ago that many of these software companies, a search engine, e-retail, whatever space without naming any specific names, that one of these would become an aerospace company and somebody would be launching rockets competing with you know, the, the, the core of the aerospace. So one of the things that I think industrial companies have now seen is that it's uh, working with the large digital players as they exist today is not really a, a you know 100% partnership because there, there's a demonstrated aspiration to get into the industrial partner's physical business. And that's good for me. I won't push back, but I could. But I'd rather take questions from the audience. Speaking of high value human activity, if you have any questions from these great brain, for these great brains and this experience, please let me know. I'll repeat them uh, so that we can make sure they're recorded. Please. So what are the things that a mayor and uh, what I'm is, uh, as the AI develops, uh, I, as AI is making part of progress, the human cognitive plane needs to, needs to grow up. In other words, humans need to evolve into making complex connections or connecting the dots. AI challenges the job of human cognition inside this, yes. Yeah. Okay, so how does AI, AI is double-edged. It can make us stupider by making us kind of in rote elements in the process, or it can challenge us to be smarter and more use our creative side. How does it do the latter in effective ways, or should that even be its job? A, a key part for, for us and how we think about it is that uh, so much of, of of AI has been focused on its binary. You're either completely automating something or you're not. Um, and in, in, in workforces, it's like you've eliminated a job or you haven't. And our view is, is actually different. There's a tremendous amount of augmentation and automation of routine processes that help out the human, but ultimately the human's still in the loop. Um, the risk that you, that you noted is that you're only as good as the data that you input, right? That's, uh, that's the, that's the 
potential flaw in, in this or, or, or weakness. Um, and if it has bad data and everybody becomes routine and is just following some rote examples of what to do and, and that data is not good, then you actually you, you lower the effectiveness and efficacy of the whole, of the whole program. That, that's the risk. That's the absolute risk. So Amir, Morlocks or super beings? Oh, I think uh, both. Uh, the, the history of man uh, suggests that uh, tool building, once it was mastered, allowed people to, you know, uh, use the output of the tool to self-direct their own evolution. And they did that in small ways because those tools were very basic. Now we can do that in very big ways. And and when I say self-directed evolution, I literally mean that in terms of the foods and other things that became accessible to us. Computers and artificial intelligence and all of these cognitive tools are no different. So you can shun them and you will be on a different track and you can embrace them, you'll be on a different track. You can embrace them for uh, things that are benign and good. You'll be on yet another track and there's also always uh, you know, the malevolent uh, that is not a function of technology, that's a function of human nature. And um, to me, I don't think that over 5,000 years we've changed human nature, but what we have done is we've created suffic sufficient amounts of technology to create enough abundance to prevent our um, propensity to get into the kinds of things that historically we've gotten into, which have all been very ugly. So uh, for me, technology is a road to that kind of plenty. But at the same time, that is just a statistical argument. Hopefully, as we create plenty, we create a better world because more people have access. But using technology for good and using technology for self-improvement will always be a personal choice. I would also argue that the nature of these things, institutions that foster creative thinkers will gain market advantage. And other companies will see that and behave in similar ways, or should. Uh, man in the back, man in the front. Man in the front, and then in the back, mm -hmm. sorry. Okay, Absolutely. right now the model is he who has the most data wins. Can a niche player beat that yeah. presumption? So just very technically, algorithms are the process by which data is transformed into a model. So more data, better models. Uh, the algorithm might remain unchanged, might also improve, but most certainly a better model. Uh, but there are many, many things that are going on right now. For example, one of the things we've discovered is that we can change the overall complexity of the neural networks that we've been using, potentially to a tenth, and reduce the amount of data that is required to create the activations that are necessary in the backpropagation algorithm and allow those networks, those models, to learn about as much with about a tenth of the data. That's one area of research. Another area of research is this uh, field called one-shot learning, where you can take a single example, just like you would with a, a child, a two-year-old or a three-year-old, and you would illustrate to them one example of something, and they're able to abstract that. So one-shot learning, again, less data, one example, you can go there. In our field, we've had to solve a lot of these problems because, you know, we go to the largest industrial companies in the world and we say, we'll predict when this very large asset might fail and might be a $100 million turbine. And if we were to adopt the traditional approaches and say, look, give me a thousand examples of your $100 million turbine failing, you know, we would be walked out of the building because that hasn't happened. Uh, so in our case also, the examples that we do have, which are the negative examples, are uh, few and far between. So I don't necessarily want to belabor the point, but there are many areas of AI, from synthetic data production to one-shot learning to transfer learning to these kinds of compressed methodologies around the frameworks of new neural networks. We believe our genetic approaches to compressed networks also yield some similar benefits, lightweight networks. There's 10 areas, at least, 
that are all looking for that holy grail that you are alluding to? I think the waiting on checking in verification will probably become more important where that's concerned. Sure. Very quickly, because we're up against the clock. Okay, how do you take, how, how can you stay sure in a highly disruptive world that the lessons of the past pertain to the actions of the future? Sir? Yeah, I, I wonder if it falls on the kind of the, the crux of the dilemma of the definition between complicated and complex. And, and you know, is, is this something we've seen before? Is it complicated, i.e., that you can reduce it uh, and, and solve it? Or is it complex with, with, with a lot of variables? So. But again, I think it'll. You know, I think the technology will help us to, uh, to discern those patterns and and to you know uh, clear the wheat from the chaff. The question that was asked earlier I, I, you know, about um, you know the, the level of cognition having to come up, I think it was very apropos. You, you, there's a there's an absolute for discipline here that you have to trust the model, you have to trust the process, so you can make more exquisite uh, and and faster uh, decisions in our line of work. Um, that right now you're you're caught up in trying to sort through. You know, the immense amount of information that's coming to you. Yeah, and, and uh, not to get technical, but some of, the, some of the answers to that general question in specific domains, because you asked a very general question, uh, but in specific domains, that answer can manifest itself through an algorithm, for example, where you don't really learn from past data, but you are synthesizing distributions from data and then uh, perturbing them and creating uh, uh, an amount of uh, variability in them that has never been seen in the real world. Uh, and in fact, along many of those axes, creating uh, interplay between those perturbed distributions that lead to highly evolved data sets that have nothing to do with the past as you saw them, uh, uh, as you saw it. So uh, it's not to say that these algorithms can only learn from things that have happened in the past. We can also imagine futures, and we can also build engines that work purely to imagine futures. And some of the promising work in this area is, is, is having that imagination from first principles and allowing these complex systems to evolve. Like I said, that is not... Um, a silver bullet for every type of problem that would fall under the definition of this issue that you raised, but many practical problems can be solved in this way. It might also be said that given our sensor networks and our level of data, we're better at discerning novel situations than we were in the past. Mm -hmm. The difficulty is going to be with the institutional bias to not recognizing them as novel right. situations that cause painful changes in behavior. Yep. But that's the world as it is today. Very I well could said. go on. I'm sorry I didn't handle all the questions. It's been a great panel. I hope we can carry on these discussions in the hallways and over lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.